Thank you, Angela. Right, welcome, everyone. And right, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this Excluded Lives event hosted by the Scottish Educational Research Association as part of the CIRA Connects um, series. There will be four presentations this afternoon, each lasting of between eight to 10 minutes. And after that, we can have questions. Um, you can, of course, also put questions and comments on the chat as we go through the, the, the session. Um, I remind you that we should mute our microphones um, as we go as we begin and a reminder also that the session is being recorded so if you don't wish your face to be seen on the screen please turn off your camera as well right that's all i need to say and i would like to hand over now to the team from edinburgh they they will be followed by alice towell from oxford and then sally power and Gemma from Cardiff and eventually Michelle, Gareth and Gavin from Queen's University Belfast. So first of all, Gillian and Laura from Edinburgh, over to you. Hello and good afternoon from Laura and myself. We're going to do, we're, we're going to talk first of all, a very short introduction about the project itself. And then we're, we're going to see a little bit about the Scotland uh, part of that. Um, I've just noticed my connection's not that stable, so please excuse me if I need to stop my video and just go on to sound only. Um, so just to put things in context for this afternoon and also to add my welcome to that that George has given, thank you very much to all who are joining us this afternoon. Um, this project, um, is a large one and it runs from 2019 to 2023 and on the slide here you can see the universities that are involved uh, the partners in this work it's led by oxford but we have teams across the UK in the four countries the overarching aim of the project as it says here is to provide a really thorough comprehensive and multidisciplinary view of the policies practices and costs of the different kinds of exclusions. So school exclusions, uh, just to be sh clear about uh, what we're talking about, exclusions are, we're talking about where young people are put out of school associated with behaviour that is seen as inappropriate or disruptive or challenging in some way. Um, so as well as looking at the uh, policies, practices and costs of those exclusions, we're also engaging directly um, in interview with uh, professionals, different stakeholders and different parts of the system and also directly with young people and their families who are, who are at risk of exclusion or have been excluded. But today what we're going to do is we're going to concentrate on one part of that larger project and that's looking at the legislative and policy context around school exclusions. And we have four research questions that belong to this part of the project. And when Laura and I talk about Scotland, we'll talk about this in a bit more detail. And then as we pass over to um, England, Wales, and then Northern Ireland, we'll each be thinking about that and working through what it means, what these questions mean for us. We have a set of larger questions in the background which have guided our analysis as we've been looking at the research questions. We don't have time to we knew we wouldn't have time in an hour this afternoon to look at all of those. But in the background, these questions are, how is the problem of exclusion understood and represented? Secondly, what are the dominant discourses? You can see that in research question one, around school exclusion. And thirdly, for this afternoon, and it's there too, what are the key levers, drivers and warrants underpinning exclusion? And it, we can talk about where these, these terms come from and how we're defining them in more detail. If anybody's interested, just pop a question in the chat if that's something you'd like to know more about. So I'm going to hand over to Laura Robertson now, who works with me on the Scottish data, and uh, let her take you through the next bits. Thanks, Gillian. So I'm going to start off by giving a very brief overview of the legislative context around school exclusions in Scotland. 
So in Scotland, children and young people can either be temporarily excluded or removed from the school register, which is permanent exclusion. And a pupil who is uh, temporarily excluded will usually return to their own school. The right to um, exclude um, is devolved to head teachers by local authorities, but this uh, decision making must also involve other professionals and outside agencies such as social work, where a child requires extra support under the Children and Young People Scotland Act 2014. And there are two circumstances under the 1975 regulations in which a young person can be excluded. So the first one is if the education or local authority are of the opinion that the parent of the pupil refuses or fails to comply or allows the pupil to comply with the rules, regulations, or the disciplinary requirements of the school. And the second, if they consider that in all circumstances to allow the pupil to continue at the school would be likely to be seriously detrimental to order and discipline within the school or the educational well-being of the pupils. The local authority is responsible for provision of education for children and young people who are excluded on a temporary basis. And the length of exclusion um, is not defined in legislation and that is decided by the local authority in school. There is an appeal process in relation to school exclusions in Scotland. Appeal firstly uh, can be made to an education appeal committee, which is at a local authority level. And a further appeal may also be made against that outcome um, to the sheriff court. So as Gillian said, we've been interested in looking at what the do dominant discourses around school exclusion are within each jurisdiction. And um, at jurisdiction level, we've examined a range of policy guidance, ministerial statements, research reports um, relating to school exclusion, but more broadly also looking at uh, behaviour management, alternative forms of provision and additional support needs. And that's been to kind of explore the, the broader context around school exclusion um, post-2010. So the most recent guidance on school exclusions in Scotland was published in 2017. It's called Included, Engaged and Involved Part 2, sorry, <laughs> a positive approach to preventing and managing school exclusions. Um, and this national guidance has very much a focus on... Sorry about this, I'm just going to shut the door. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so this guidance is very much underpinned by a focus on children's rights and participation and inclusion, um, as well as supporting and improving the well-being of children and young people and taking a whole school approach and community approach to well-being. Um, Scotland has had a, a massive focus on, on children's rights and developing their understanding of their rights and others. Um, and um, that has been seen in the um, incorporation of the UNCRC. And so the Scottish Government guidance on school exclusion states that inclusion should only be used as a last resort. It should be a proportionate response where there is no alternative and it is important that the views of the child or young person and uh, their parents are taken into account. So as Gillian mentioned, we've also been interested in looking at what the key policy levers and drivers are that underpin school exclusion policy within each jurisdiction. So um, examining the policy papers that we've mentioned, we've identified several key policy levers. So we've understood these as instruments that the Scottish government and local authority and schools have at their disposal to reduce um, school exclusions. So in Scotland, local authorities are required to develop their own guidance on um, school exclusion. Um, but this should be based on the national guidance and underpinned by the legislative framework. Um, and across Scotland, um, local authorities and schools provide um, support to young people um, through a staged intervention model approach. So firstly, there's the universal stage, which is focused on support within the school. 
Secondly, there's support within the school which is more targeted. Um, so this might be in a designated base or a unit within the school. Thirdly, there's support beyond the school within the local authority. So there's a, a massive emphasis in Scotland on working with um, partnerships and, and third sector organisations in terms of providing support. And fourthly, it is providing support um, beyond the local authority. So that might involve um, specialist day provision or residential care, for example. So um, funding um, is a key lever in relation to responses to school exclusion. And um, I don't have time to go into everything um, in this presentation, but the Scottish government has been very focused on addressing the a poverty attainment gap in recent years. And that has kind of changed the funding um, that's available to local authorities and schools. So schools in deprived areas um, get funding through the Pupil Equity Fund, which means there's very localised um, context in terms of provision of support. Um, for young people who are at risk of exclusion. But we do have um, research which, does, which is done on a frequent basis, looking at the ranges of approaches that have been used by schools. So um, most schools have adopted approaches based on nurturing, so developing relationships, um, and also utilise um, restorative approaches. So moving on to talk a little bit about how is the problem of school exclusion understood. So this is kind of understandings of school exclusion um, underpinning the, the policy in Scotland. So um, looking at the Scottish Government guidance on school exclusion, um, there's a focus throughout on the individual circumstances of um, children and young people, and particularly on the impacts of poverty and how that relates to school exclusion. There's also a very specific focus on the fact that children and young people with uh, specific needs um, are more likely to be excluded. So that includes children um, with additional support needs and looked after children, children with protected characteristics. And this um, in particular has been a key focus in relation to looked after children. Um, so recently the Independent Care Review published recommendations in Scotland and the key, one of the key goals from that review was that formal and informal school exclusion of care experienced children should end by 2024. Um, and lastly, um, we've examined a lot of the language use in the policy documents, and um, the focus is very much on understanding behaviour as um, a form of communication. There is no reference at all in the, the, the key policy guidance to punishment. Um, and instead, it's very much based on uh, forming positive relationships and um, positive behaviour. Uh, so that's me finished um, talking about the Scottish context, but please do get in touch with Jolene and myself if you have any questions. So I am now going to pass on to Alice. Just stop sharing my slides. Thanks. I'll try and put my slides up. Um... Laura, I'm not sure if you could put them up for me. It doesn't seem to be coming up right now. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be talking today about um, school exclusion legislation and, and the policy context in England and I'll follow a similar format to the presentation that Laura's um, just given. So if we go first to uh, the legislation, um, the governing statutory provision on school exclusion in England is section 51A10 of the Education Act 2002 um, which provides that those in charge of schools or alternative, alternative providers, so school leaders, may exclude a pupil for either a fixed period or permanently. And they define exclude as meaning exclude on disciplinary grounds. So the, the current statutory guidance states that a decision to exclude a pupil permanently should be a last resort 
when all other um, resources have been exhausted and should only be taken in response to a serious breach or persistent breaches of the school's behaviour policy and where allowing the people to remain in school would seriously harm the education or welfare of the people or others in the school. It, it also states in the statutory guidance that where possible, um, schools should avoid um, permanently excluding children with education, health and care plans or those who are looked after children. So in coming to an exclusion decision, the head teacher must apply the civil standard of proof. So that's on the balance of probabilities rather than the criminal standard of beyond reasonable doubt. And they must ensure that their decision is lawful, reasonable and fair. So this means that the head teacher should take account of any contributing factors that are identified after an incident of poor behaviour has occurred. For example, where it comes to light that a pupil has suffered bereavement, has mental health issues, or has been subjected to bullying. And the head teacher and governing board must also comply with their duties under the Equalities Act 2010 to not discriminate against, harass, or victimise pupils because of sex, race, disability, religion, or belief, sexual orientation, pregnancy, maternity, or gender reassignment. If we, so one thing to just note, sorry, if we can just go back quickly, Laura, is that um, what our colleague Lucinda Ferguson, who is the lawyer working on the project, has said is that actually the statutory guidance um, the, the governing statutory provision on permanent exclusion provides a discretionary re regime within which decision makers exercise what she called supported autonomy. And so the exclusion process, what happens next? The local authority are responsible for finding provision for the pupil um, from the sixth day following a permanent exclusion. And it's the governing board of a school who retains responsibility for arranging alternative provision for a pupil who receives a fixed period exclusion lasting longer than five days. There is also a process of review in England. So in the first instance, the governing boards of the schools um, have a duty to consider an exclusion. And there they're considering the decision made by the head teacher. Um, so yeah, reviewing the, head, the school leader's decision to exclude. They also hear representations from the school um, parent and the pupil is encouraged to attend. If the parent, if the governing body upholds the decision and the parent is unhappy, they can then take uh, the decision to an independent review panel. Um, now the independent review panel can either uphold the decision, um, recommend that the governing board considers reinstatement at this stage, they are now considering the decision making of the governors. Or if one or more of the grounds of judicial review is made out, they can quash the, the decision and direct the governing board to reconsider reinstatement. Um, and in cases where there is an allegation of discrimination, parents can also bring a claim under the Equalities Act um, to the first tier tribunal or the county court. Can we go to the next slide, please? So then just turning to um, the policy drivers and dominant discourses, I've chosen to look at a period from 2010 to 2021. And this is really because 2010 sort of saw um, a particular juncture in the way that school exclusion policy um, and the, the policy discourse was set out. So um, if we look at the white paper in 2010, as well as the subsequent um, Education Act of 2011, what we see is that, um, that there was an unequivocal kind of desire to reinstate um, head teachers' right to exclude and to strengthen their right to exclude. So an article on the gov.uk website proclaims that the white paper and subsequent 2011 Education Act sought to restore adult authority in the classroom and address behavior in schools by firstly, giving stronger powers to teachers to search pupils without consent, to impose detentions on a pupil without notice and, and to introduce independent review panels, which I've just um, explained. Now, prior to independent review panels, um, there was an independent appeal panel 
um, process. And that panel was actually able to direct reinstatement. So the change was that the independent review panel was no longer able to direct. Um, it also repealed the requirement for schools to enter into behavior and attendance partnerships to support early intervention and prevention measures. And actually what you see, if you look at the 2008 guidance around school exclusion, um, and then look at the subsequent 2012 guidance, there was a removal of all mentions of early intervention um, and prevention. So there was a section at the very beginning, it was section one that looked at this and alternatives to exclusion. So just have a, I have a quote here from Nick Gibb, um, who was talking about these changes and he said, tackling poor behavior and raising academic standards are key priorities for the coalition government. We will back head teachers in excluding persistently disruptive pupils, which is why we are removing barriers which limit their authority. And so here we, we have to understand this in kind of the broader changes to education policy that were happening at the time. So behavior is very much um, subsumed within the standards agenda. And this kind of um, bolstering of, of teachers authority um, is possibly also linked to the movement to give schools more, more authority, which is primarily seen through the introduction of, of the Academies Act in 2010 as well. So that's the kind of first strand. We've got head teachers have a right to exclude. And then we have um, on another strand, which is about improving um, alternative provision. Um, so you can see here again that actually, although all of those things that I was just talking about came from sort of the 20, the earlier period, so 2010, 2012, if we look at the Conservative Manifesto in 2019, we're still seeing a similar um, uh, pattern. Sorry, I don't know what happened there, I'll just reshare it. That's okay. Um, so yeah, so what we see is we will back head to back heads and teachers on discipline will expand our program to help schools with the worst behavior learn from the best and back heads to use exclusion and we will also expand alternative provision schools for those who have been excluded um, so on the one hand you have this increasing the power of heads to exclude and then you also have the improvement of the education provision for those children who are excluded then moving on, I suppose, to more recent times, we, we also see that um, there's quite a big emphasis, and this is in looking at the 2017 statutory guidance now, that it's unlawful to exclude for a non-disciplinary reason. Um, and so there's been quite a lot of concern, particularly around off-rolling, which is the practice of finding ways to remove a student from school, uh, from a school's role by means other than permanent exclusion. And this is for the benefit of the school and not the student. And um, so that became quite a big kind of new policy discourse. And I suppose what we saw was um, this idea that we should be reducing preventable exclusions. We shouldn't be preventing exclusion because it is a necessary sanction that, that head teachers should have in their toolbox, but we should be reducing preventable exclusions. Now that in itself, indicates that some exclusions are not preventable. Looking at sort of the discourses coming out from other players or policy influences, we actually see that there is this um, move towards talking more about upstreaming and so trauma-informed practice, whole school approaches, public health approaches, um, but this doesn't yet seem to have um, sort of infiltrated into DfE guidance. And so what are the key policy levers? So we've already talked about the legislative changes that happened. Um, there was also subsequent issuing of behavior guidance, which again, reiterated um, things like, um, you know, there's, there's subheadings that are things like punishing poor behavior, behavior and sanctions, the use of seclusion rooms, isolation rooms, the use of reasonable force. And so what we see is this kind of culture of understanding behavior um, and exclusion as involving or needing to be about control and compliance um, rather than sort of the way that, that Laura was explaining in Scotland. Um, and this, this is also linked to the use of experts. So we have, and, and 
behaviour advisors, who we have uh, prominent figures in, in government, um, who sort of um, declare this, this kind of policy position um, in their work. And one of the things that currently is coming out is the 10 million pounds, which is being put into behaviour hubs, which is being run by one of these uh, behaviour experts called Tom Bennett. Um, I've put Ofsted inspections there as well. And this is really more towards that off-rolling point where um, Ofsted are, are cracking down on off-rolling. And so that has been one way to sort of deal with this um, problem of unlawful exclusion. So just lastly, how is the problem of school exclusion understood? Um, again, like Laura mentioned in the English guidance, there is um, some recognition that um, exclusion disproportionately affects certain groups. So particularly um, those from uh, ethnic minority backgrounds, um, those with special educational needs, looked after children um, and boys in particular. So there is, there is this kind of acknowledgement um, and there is also an acknowledgement of the kind of negative individual and societal consequences that can come out of exclusion. And so in the, the 2017 guidance, for example, it says disruptive behavior can be an indication of unmet needs where a school has concerns about a pupil's behavior. It should try to identify whether there are any causal factors and intervene early in order to reduce the need for a subsequent exclusion. So in this situation, schools should consider whether a multi-agency assessment that goes beyond the pupils' educational needs is required. And so it is, is getting at that, but, but actually in many ways, behavior is still largely decontextualized. And there are very few mentions of the kind of factors outside of the child that may be affecting uh, their behavior. So it's kind of reacting to the behavior that's presented. Behavior is seen as a choice rather than behavior as communication, as Laura mentioned. Um, again, you could say that the problem is actually unlawful exclusion, as we've seen with the, the focus on off-rolling. And we could also see that where there was a crackdown on behavior, that behavior is seen as the problem, and actually exclusion could be seen as the solution to that problem, although it's probably a solution for the, the school rather than the child. So I'll um, hand over now to Gareth. I think it's Sally and Gemma. Oh, Sally, sorry. Yeah. Apologies. Hi, Gemma. Are you okay to put up the slides up? I believe so. Can you see it? Yeah. Um, my slides are gone. There's one on the bottom, or there's. <laughs> Right, bottom right, right again. There. Is that it? Yeah. Oh. It's covered by the um, the bar at the top. Oh, there we go. Okay. So we're just going to give a brief overview of uh, the legislative and policy context in Wales. Before Gemma goes through some of the detail, we thought it would be helpful just to outline the broad differences in the policy context. Next slide, Gemma. So since democratic devolution in 1999, Wales has tried very hard to put what it's called clear red water between Wales and particularly England, which really uh, controlled the education system before that. And it's uh, developed some principles of governance. And these, the ones I've listed here, were actually set out by Mark Drakeford uh, several years ago. And of course, he is now the, the first minister of Wales. And basically in Wales, and these, these kind of have some relevance to exclusion processes, but in a very general background way. So in Wales, there's a commitment to universalism, so uh, to comprehensive schooling. So we have no academies, no grammar schools, um, no specialist schools. So, so we have a universal system of provision. We have one which emphasizes participation. So we don't have league tables. Um, so it's a kind of anti-competition uh, system. There's an underlying uh, principle that cooperation is much better than competition. Um, so there's not really a concern with driving up standards through competition. So that has given, um, there's a lot of emphasis on partnership working. Uh, we have 
uh, still have retained very strong local authorities who partner with each other in, in consortia in Wales. And it's also uh, underpinned by a principle of pro progressivism, whereas in England it's possible to say that the, the curriculum, for instance, is one of cultural restoration, where it's very important to have uniform and kind of traditional techniques, all of which might be seen as contributing to a climate in which the which might affect the frequency of which students are disciplined and then potentially excluded. We've looked at a whole range of documents since uh, democratic devolution in, in Wales, and I put out three of the, of the discourses around relating to school exclusion that seem to be dominant. And by far the most one that begins almost every document on school exclusions is an assertion of the rights of the child and reference to the United Nations um, document. Also, there's quite a lot of references to poverty and the extent to which adverse material circumstances in communities and in families leads to various forms of problems um, that can lead to ex school ex be a factor in school exclusion. And there's also less, less prominently, but still there, a recognition that uh, exclusions can result from disengagement uh, of the child with the, with the curriculum, with the extent to which the curriculum is seen to be irrelevant um, to the needs of the child. There's relatively little reference to uh, punishment. In fact, this is kind of tends to move away from the idea of behaviour management to one a bit like, as, as um, Laura was saying, towards kind of building positive um, positive relations. Gemma's going to talk through some of the policy levers that the Welsh Government uses to, not just the Welsh Government, but, but other stakeholders to try and reduce exclusions in Wales. The legislative framework, some of these are hard, like the legislative framework, and some are soft, like commissioning research, setting targets. There's incentives to, for schools to reduce levels of exclusions, and also uh, a number of people that provide guidance and resources. And I'm going to hand over to Gemma now, who's going to talk about these in more detail. Amazing, thank you. She can get to the next slide. Okay, amazing. So in terms of the legislative framework, the first thing I wanted to talk about was the Equality Act. So the Equality Act is throughout the guidance on school exclusion. Schools aren't prohibited from excluding a young person with a protected characteristic, but they can't exclude a young person because of their protected characteristic, so they couldn't exclude a young person because of a disability, and the equality legislation is all through the guidance. The second guidance that really comes through the second legislation is the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, and it comes through all Welsh policy. And I literally just read just before this presentation, in 2011, Wales was the first country to make the UNCRC part of domestic law. In terms of school exclusion, when young people are being excluded, their rights need to be considered and it needs to be in the best interest of the child. So the UNCRC is fundamental for that. Amazing pioneering legislation for Wales is the Wales uh, Future Generations and um, the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act even. So when public authorities are making decisions about people, they need to consider the long term impact for people, especially children. And you can't pick up a report from the Future Generations Commissioner without seeing something about school exclusion um, in a report recently. She asked Welsh Government to consider long term impacts of school exclusion, the, the factors that cause school exclusion, such as poverty, are perpetuated when a young person is excluded from school. So the decision to exclude is a serious one. It's meant to be an acknowledgement by schools. They've considered all different strategies. They've considered everything they can, pastoral support programmes, restorative justice, it's an admission by the school that they can't do any more for that young person, basically, and it's a serious one as it is in, in all the other nations. Okay, so one of the levers has been commissioning research. 
So Welsh Government has been very good at that. So in 2011, they commissioned two third sector organisations to look at unlawful exclusions. Now, what was clever about that is the fact is unlawful exclusions are hidden and both third sector organisations had a caseload. They helped children who'd been excluded and their parents with exclusion cases. So they had a, a cohort that they could talk to. And one of the recommendations of that report was that they should move away from punitive um, exclusions and be more supportive of young people. Following the devolution as well, we've looked at England less for policy and we've looked at similar smaller countries. And in 2013, the University of Edinburgh uh, completed a research project on school exclusion and alternative provision. And I'm going to read out one of the um, recommendations because I don't want to get it wrong because um, one of the authors is actually here. Um, so um, one of the recommendations was Welsh Government should emphasise the use of exclusion from school as a sanction of last resort and in the longer term move away from exclusion from school as a disciplinary measure. Um, in terms of setting targets, the first Welsh Government policy on education mentioned a target to reduce school exclusion by a third and they were on their way for that um, achieving that target. But the latest guidance doesn't really talk about targets. It talks about targets for individual learning plans for learners, much more emphasis on support and reintegrating learners into a mainstream education as well. OK, in terms of setting targets and incentives for school, we kind of moved away from league tables and SATs and all that sort of stuff. Um, but in 2010, PISA results weren't great for Wales. We were behind all the other four UK nations, which has improved. We're getting better. Um, but since then, Welsh Government launched a banding system. And you kind of can sort of see it on the slide. It's a traffic light system and they look at complex factors, but it's not judging schools. It's looking at how much support schools need rather than categorizing them, if that makes sense. Um, it looks at which schools need the most help and support and guidance and it's tied with support for the schools. In terms of incentives for schools, um, there's a pupil deprivation grant. It's a pot of money for each young person in school or, or child who has free school meals or is classed as a looked after child. It's a pot of funding aimed at improving outcomes and in 2017, it was £1,150, so it's about that amount. Welsh Government are also bringing in new legislation, which is really exciting on additional learning needs, and they're, they're having a much more comprehensive structure around that with um, support plans um, and making sure that you know young people's needs are met as well, because young people with additional learning needs are really overrepresented in the school exclusion figures as well in an alternative provision. There's also universal measures as well. So the um, the whole school to um, mental health, whole school approach even, I'll get my teeth in in a minute, to mental health and well-being is something, and that's looking at more universal prevention and relationship-based approaches in schools. And again, it's, it's about addressing poverty and adverse child experiences. So adverse child experiences are mentioned a lot in poverty and you know, if young people have negative experiences in their family, it, it can transfer to school. And, and one way we're looking at that is more relationship-based approaches and being kinder, basically. So in terms of guidance, so Welsh Government have produced very clear guidance on school exclusion and on the processes, and it can be read by a range of stakeholders. It's useful for head teachers, it's useful for school governors and parents. It's really set out clearly. Most of the guidance for local authorities is about putting alternative provision in place for the learner once they have been excluded from school. So that's quite positive as well. Only a head teacher can take the decision to exclude or a, a teacher in charge of a pupil referral unit. And much of the guidance is aimed at them. But as I said, it's broad, clear, easy read guidance uh, for all the stakeholders involved in that. So for, par uh, for parents and young people, they can go to the ombudsman. I said I couldn't say this, didn't I, earlier? <laughs> um, 
and they provide guidance and um, they can look at the exclusion process and whether it's been done fairly and they can look at whether suitable alternative education has been put in place for the children or the young person. They can also go to the Children's Commissioner for help. Um, the Children's Commissioner has actually released a report called Building Blocks and a Toolkit based on their caseload of school exclusion cases. And um, what, I, what I really liked as well was Welsh Government have produced guidance for children and young people about the exclusion process. And that explains it really clearly to them, what's happening um, and what, what the procedure is. Um, and I'm going to hand back over to Sally now. <laughs> Thanks, Gemma. This is just the last slide. I just want to draw out some of the, I suppose, tensions and silences in the policy documents and, and between the, the levers and, and the practice. We know informally, and this is something we'll hope to research, that there's um, a number of, there's quite a lot of, of off-rolling, there's quite a lot of um, in, in inclusions within the school where, where children are sent to exclusion units within, within our premises, but are not officially excluded. And we wonder whether things like setting targets um, and putting pressure on schools not to exclude actually might encourage unofficial exclusionary practices which can be just as or even more damaging than unofficial exclusions. There's a, so there's something about the unintended consequence of, of strong policy levers to drive down exclusions. There's also something of attention, this is the kind of age old issue that, that around educational inequalities, um, that if the problems are caused by poverty or material circumstances outside the school, um, it's very hard to, to leave, use policy levers within the educational welfare system to, system to redress those. So there might be something of a mismatch between how the problem is defined and the measures put in place to address it. And finally, it's about um, the silences in, in some of the policy documents and, and whose rights are being... So there's a lot of talk about the, the rights of the child. And they are usually about the child who's potentially at risk of exclusions, whereas some might argue, and probably a lot of the teachers would argue, that the rights of other children are somehow marginalised, so whose, whose rights are being prioritised. So there's a lot of dilemmas and discussions within the policy documents um, that, again, is something that we'll hope to explore um, as we do more empirical research. And I'm going to move, let Northern Ireland um, talk about what's happening there. Gemma, can you stop sharing? Great. Michelle, are you ready to present? That'll be me, George. And I think it's, I think it's actually Gareth that's presenting. Let's see. Can everybody see my screen? Okay, I can't. Oh. George, can you just let me know if everybody can see that? Or not. I can see it, so I presume everyone else can, Gary. Um, okay, well, very quickly, um, just we're, we're going to take a slightly different tact on our presentation. Uh, we do we do like to be uh, sort of different, but the same over here. So um, we are going to present uh, exclusively on the documents that we retrieve from our policy search. Um, so Gillian referred to at the start, the analysis framework that we, we kind of have drawn upon is this back ease, what's the problem to be represented approach. And so in our search, we have um, sort of explored three different uh, spaces within the, the policy environment. So official policy and legislation, ministerial statements and media, and uh, the civil society and community sector. So this presentation is going to go very quickly, a very, very brief overview of each of them um, in terms of how they respond to each of the questions within that backy framework that we've loosely applied. So first of all, the, the retrieval, the retrieve search um, that we have and the documents. Um, in the policy space, we had 13 documents that span across 31 years, so not a lot, it's quite sparse. Uh, and the majority of those seems to be uh, school circulars. And then moving into the media and uh, activity at Stormont, again, there's not a lot going back. Uh, if you look back throughout the timeline, um, there's 14 documents, the majority of those are media articles, and they are all based uh, relative more or less on the same incident. Uh, it was drawn attention to by Paris Hilton, of all people. Um, so uh, that's sort of the, the activity in that space. 
Um, I should say as well that the archive, the official archive that's dormant only goes back until about 2010 when they digitized records. Uh, so um, there may be stuff prior to that, but at this point, this is where our, our search has got us to. And then the civil society and community sector is much more active over the years. Uh, there's 31 documents in total. Um, so how is the problem represented uh, of school exclusion? In the policy space, there's a shift in narrative across those 31 years. So it begins uh, sort of couching the problem underneath school improvement and that uh, you get extreme behaviours that affect the educational outcomes of other pupils and safety. Um, and then as we move towards the other end of the timeline, more recently, um, it, a focus seems to shift from exclusion to inclusion and uh, special educational needs. So um, I think in one of the documents in the late 90s, it refers to pupils with problems, and that then becomes uh, special educational needs supports in more up-to-date uh, policy guidance. Um, rights. During that timeline, in terms of children's truth, parental rights, it's seen as an imposition. I think in one of the documents in the late 90s, it refers to specifically parental rights as uh, an inconvenience to teaching staff. Uh, and that wasn't really changed in the official policy narrative until about 2004. Um, in terms of the media, they rarely they, they draw attention to more extreme incidents and therefore they don't happen all that frequently. Um, so in terms of representing the problem of school exclusion, they don't represent the broader problem that we're hoping to capture. Um, Stormont is, is largely reactionary in their agenda and they react to public opinion. So they reflect uh, what the media has been saying over the last few years. Um, and that is largely around restraint and seclusion rather than explicitly school exclusion. Um, the civil society and community sector then, they tend to, to focus on the problem of school exclusion being represented by factors internal and external to schools. So things like the social background and circumstances of the young people who are maybe more uh, disproportionately affected by school exclusion. And then the learning environment, uh, is the learning environment fit for the needs of those pupils? Uh, and how can they make the model of education here, the system of education better fit? Uh, what are the dominant discourses around school exclusion in the policy space? Um, it's about setting expectations for schools. So they use uh, legalistic language, procedural and structural. Um, and a lot of that um, comes from circulars. And those circulars are focused on things like uh, informing schools how to formally record their suspensions and reminding schools to formally record their suspensions. So there is a, a sort of reading between the lines. Schools may not be following procedure. And so there's this aspect of legal backstopping to save themselves from litigation, potentially. Um, in the space of ministerial statements and media, um, they reflect, they kind of have a similar or echo one another, um, that they're feeling certain types of pupils. So, uh, and those pupils are largely special educational needs pupils. Uh, in the civil society and community sector then, the dominant discourse is there, no surprises around children's rights. Uh, and they have a very focused uh, children-centered approach to things and perspective, and they draw attention to the fact that there's a lack of ass assessment and resources available. Um, what are the, the policy levers, drivers, and warrants underpinning school exclusion then? Um, so in terms of the, in the policy space, the mechanisms to implement policy then are promoting good behavior, um, which is a, a document going back to 1999, um, pastoral care in schools, 2001, and then uh, the youth school uh, ethos. Each school has their own independent uh, uh, individual ethos. Uh, so they use those as a way to implement the policies um, around school exclusion. Um, and then the drivers of that, the, the aims and goals of those sort of suite of policies, if you like, um, are around school improvement and create safe working environments for both pupils and staff. Uh, and in one of the forewords to uh, one of the documents, uh, the minister at the time refers to relationship building as one of the sort of aims of these documents uh, to build relationships between the pupils and staff and, and staff and other colleagues. Um, so within all of this, these policy documents, th there is a claim that it's evidentiary, that the warrant is evidentiary based on evidence and data, but it, very rarely, if, if ever, you see actual data in the documentation. Um, there are elements then spring of account accountability, accountability. And uh, that sort of refers to the fact that um, schools seem not to be following procedures, so they're constantly reminding them to record things in an appropriate uh, way uh, and formal way as well. Um, so the space with ministerial statements and media, um, 
they don't really apply the policy levers that they have with their tools uh, in their arsenal. The lack of plenary sessions and, and committee pressure, they don't seem to call them an awful lot. There's three in the past, I think, nearly 10 years. Um, and they weren't exclusively about uh, school exclusion. They were to address um, an issue that arose around restraint and seclusion and the lack of guidance around that. Um, so the driver or the, the aim and intention of that was to address lack of guidance around aspects of exclusion, ironically. Uh, there isn't a lot of that still. Um, the warrants should be political and justified sort of by political opinion and national interest, but there's little to no policy action, so there isn't necessarily any anything to underpin. Um, Civil society and community sector, they take a sort of slightly different approach to it. Uh, they have an alternative focus on the impact and outcomes of these policies, um, but they do query the purpose, processes and, and impact. So they look at um, sort of the sanctions and informal exclusions that may be taking place within the, the system that are uh, not documented. And then also um, they refer to the alternative and community-based provisions. Um, so, uh, yeah. What are the solutions to school exclusion in, given in Northern Ireland? Um, the policy space, um, it, it seems to be this uh, increase in bureaucracy or reliance on bureaucracy. So the legitimization through formal recording of incidents. Um, there's a decentralization of responsibility and that's a sort of more complex um, notion. And it starts off in the timeline with the educational library boards that then become obsolete. And in that period of time, they're decentralizing some of the responsibility to schools and offloading that responsibility and then the, the central education authority is established and again there's more offloading of responsibility in the schools and the rationale for that one of the earlier documents is that the school is best placed to suit the needs of the pupil and they know the context much better than say the education authority would um, other solutions that they provide um, are an introduction of alternatives and supports for SEN pupils, uh, flexible curriculum and early identification and whole school approaches. But what I should say about the solution within the policy space is that it's a patchwork of solutions rather than one coherent consolidated framework or a national policy. Um, so that, that'll be one of our absences. Um, ministerial statements and media. Um, the media problematize school exclusions, um, but only in a very small amount of incidents, uh, and they offer no solutions on those, so they, they don't draw from the broader um, problem. Uh, and uh, instalment, um, on the occasions that it was brought to plenary session, um, they have cited Scotland as an example for solutions, and I think they refer to uh, the national policy and uh, also how they link to youth justice services. Um, civil society and community sector, um, their solutions are driven uh, or based in quality, diversity and inclusion. Um, they also draw attention to the fact that there are marginalised groups in Northern Ireland um, and a lot of them are affected um, by the legacy issues of the conflict here, um, things like transgenerational traumas and uh, then other marginalised groups like the travelling community and others, um, newcomers for example. Um, and again, they would advocate for uh, a better fit learning environment for those pupils and also early interventions. Who are the key influencers in the policy field? Um, the Department of Education are the main driver in official policy. Um, the form of public opinion pressure seems to be that that steers the ministers at Stormont and obviously the media. Um, celebrities like Paris Hilton again and uh, BBC and then local print, uh, print news organisations but they don't get involved that often. They don't tend to have, a, they build momentum through publishing the same story over and over with slight changes as things update. Uh, and then civil society and community sector, um, the children's rights advocacy, uh, advocacy groups would be the main influence here, of which there are many. Um, and then this is sort of um, the interesting one, I think, um, is where are the sciences and absences here. Um, in terms of the policy space, um, we have a very different system of education. We have a, um, a divided system of education where there are different school sectors representing different communities. So we have a um, Catholic maintaining schools, controlled schools for Protestant pupils, de facto, uh, integrated in Irish medium, et cetera. Um, and most of those have different schemes for how and processes for how they exclude. Um, that is acknowledged within the, the official policies, but the impact of them aren't discussed or described. Um, there's also a lack of a single overarching national policy and the majority of our guidance here is outdated. Um, then there's stalled implementation. So where there has been updated guidance or policy, um, political instability has meant that those haven't been implemented uh, in full. Uh, and in other instances, the department have been slow to respond to implementation. So things like the disaggregation of special educational needs data in uh, suspension data. 
uh, and then children's rights considerations are largely absent from the policy um, formulations. Uh, ministerial statements and media then, there is, uh, seems to be a, a lack of clear focus on school exclusion uh, and Stormont are reactionary, as I said before, to incidences of here that is uh, electorally relevant, shall we say. Uh, and then um, they don't reflect the experiences of the broader school population. The media specifically tend to hone in on those that are more extreme. Um, civil society and community sector then draw attention to um, absences or issues around data capture um, and then engagement with guidance for parents and children so that they know what their rights are in relation to the processes for exclusion and suspension and those are child friendly, uh, making education relevant so that those um, children who find themselves in, or, or younger pupils who find themselves in alternative provision for education um, maybe have access to practice-based curricula or um, vocational subjects. And then uh, lastly, they, they also have for an integrated multi-sector model in which different organizations external to the school um, work alongside the family and schools themselves to uh, create a sort of more holistic approach around the child. Um, so that's the end of our presentation. In terms of the um, actual overview of the legislation here, um, I've skipped right past that at the very beginning um, because we've taken a different tack to this. Uh, but this paper does kind of shed a little bit of light on it if you want to look that up. And then if you want to connect with us as well, and there's some of our details. Thank you. I think I hand back to George then, do it. Yeah, thanks very much. Thank you, Gareth. Well, thanks to all our presenters for four absolutely fascinating presentations. Um, We've got two minutes left of our official time. Um, can I ask Angela what the possibilities are for overrunning? Can we do that? Yes, we can. Yeah, that's lovely. That's fine. Thank you. Right. Okay. We, apart from Mona, oh. You're okay, George. You can keep going. All right. Okay. It's just I've lost the connection. We had um, some interesting questions on the, on the chat. And if David Watt can hear me, David, can we go to your first question? Um, I'm going to have to ask you to, to present it yourself, if, if that's okay. Okay, no problem. Um, just in terms of the United Nations views in, uh, from the Committee on uh, Disabilities, it uh, raised the question of uh, not enrolling those due to behaviour issues um, and <clears throat> people have flashed out, flashed out. I was also wanting to make the point that uh, within Scotland, it's been a 20 year policy development involving teacher trade unions, the government, uh, Education Scotland, and that has changed over time from discipline to behaviour to, as Laura mentioned, relationships. And just a, a, a final point would be, um, and it's, it's missing from each of the presentations, uh, within Scotland, the decline in exclusions has uh, has been significant, from about forty five thousand to less than twenty thousand. Matched up with that has been a decline in youth offending uh, within Scotland in the past twenty years. Uh, roughly in a, a similar vein is is uh, a two thirds decline. Uh, Scotland's child, children are better behaved, um, but they never get the credit for it. Um, and I think we also have to highlight how well they do, as well as highlighting what needs to be done to be more inclusive in our practices. Okay, would any of the presenters like to respond to David, but especially about the UN meeting the, the, the requirements across the UK? I'm happy to say something about I not I don't really can't really talk about the United Nations requirements across but I think I think the problem I mean Wales if we look at our data we have much better um, exclusion uh, figures certainly in terms of permanent exclusions than in England and it it clearly is so in some ways we are doing things right but we also know that they hide a lot of stuff beneath the surface and it's whether hiding things beneath the surface, it, it, it depends what's under the surface and whether it's the exclusion figures really reflect improved behaviour and in and better relationships in the school. And why is it to do with the curriculum, which we've kind of got your curriculum now in Wales, um, or is it um, 
or is it something else? So it's getting at what's going on underneath the official figures. And certainly in Wales, I would, I'm a bit skeptical that our lower figures reflect, mean that, that Welsh school children are better than they were 15 years ago. Yeah, thanks, Sally. Um, anyone else, Alice, you want to respond or? Sorry, I was busy um, <laughs> sending Sorry, a, a link about something else. Um, yeah, I'm not. I'm not entirely sure um, what I can add. Yeah. Really. Okay, that's fine. Um, we had some specific questions. Well, Kathy's gone, but she her answer's been her question has been answered. I've got a question from Jai Lingard. I'm sorry, I don't know your first name. Um, are you there or would you like me to read your question? Uh, the person's just dipped out, George, so you might have to just read the question. Oh, right, okay. If I can find it then. Right, okay. Right. Scrolling through the, the chat to try and find it. I've got it, George, if you want me to see it. Right, on you. Oh, I've got it. It's what happens when schools reach their 45 days of FTE and where can we find guidance on this? Would that be for, given the time that it came in, would that be for? I think, I think it's for me and. Yeah, Alice, yeah. I think that's what I was trying to go back and look at. So in the statutory guidance, I think it says something that if you are reaching the limit of 15 days of um, uh, fixed period exclusion within a term that the governing board should meet to review that. Um, I don't know if it says the same thing for 45 days, but I would presume that would be um, what would happen in that case as well. So it's um, taking it to the, the governing board and, and having a discussion about how effective the use of exclusion is being really and, and what alternatives they could could try um, and I did find right. a link okay. from the well, well, National Governance Association which I can pop in the, the chat which might be helpful. Okay right thanks for your there Alice. Um, Paul Adams who's gone had another question about regarding was there a difference in terms of free schools and academies in, in terms of exclusions was there do, have you noticed any difference there or in comparison to state, state schools and other schools? Um, well, we haven't specifically looked at that difference, although, um, you know, that there has been other research that has looked at um, exclusion rates within academies compared to uh, maintained schools. Um, there's kind of mixed results on, on whether one is more likely to exclude or, or the other. Um, yeah, uh, so so we haven't looked at it specifically ourselves, but I could also find some links to previous research if that's if that's of interest. Yeah. Right. Okay. Are there any more uh, questions from the, the the audience? No. Okay then. Uh, I'd like to just round up this session by once again thanking our presenters for really powerful presentations. And I, I think what comes through here so much is the richness of doing this over the four jurisdictions, um, because what can be perceived as differences to me add to the richness of, of what's happening. So, for example, even where there are um, similarities, for example, each of the, the, the jurisdictions talks about last resorts and proportionality and support and so on and so forth. But then when we look below that, um, and see what's happening. We can see how these mean different things in the different jurisdictions, sometimes subtly different, sometimes quite remarkably different. Um, for, for example, um, whilst in every um, jurisdiction there is um, a, a movement towards support, supporting schools, supporting pupils, how that seems to be represented in the policy drivers and, 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 and the, the policy itself is really quite different from a quite legislative and detailed um, approach in England. You know, that they seem to be quite 
um, I'm critical of your own situation in England there, Alice. Yeah, it's the mo to me, it, it sounded like the most detailed um, uh, description of, of, of the approach. Um, and it's going to be really interesting when you come to the next stage of your projects, where you start to get the experiences of the people involved, the experience of the schools, the head teachers, the experiences of parents, and most importantly, the experiences of the young people who have been excluded. And really forward to look forward to another um, CIRA Connects event where we can start to explore these things. Okay, I'd like to thank everyone again, and I'd like to thank everyone in the audience who turned up, and I'd like to thank CIRA for hosting this event. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you very much as well, George. Thank you very much for help. No for problem, Jillian. Bye. Bye.